All right. Welcome back, everyone, to another Serious Angler podcast. Today, we are joined by Mr. Alex Blackwell. How are we doing today, sir? Doing all right, man. Finally, de-stressing from your your, your long hours of, of editing. I'm sure you're, you're used to these days, but uh, hopefully this will de-stress you a little bit, get to kind of rekindle some old memories and talk a little bit about what you do. So I'm pretty excited. Yeah, man, I'm absolutely excited. It's always good to kind of talk about one story, but more importantly, what gets us into fishing, what drives us to keep going, and uh, yeah, no, what 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 uh what really keeps us uh, pushing forward when you're just you're taken <laughs> back by the amount of work that you have to do. Yep. But yeah, man, I'm excited. Yeah, it, I stumbled upon your page a while ago because I was always kind of curious because I've been one to watch so many YouTube channels. If I'm not fishing or working. School's over now, so thankfully I have more time to waste, you know, watching the immense amount of YouTube channels that uh, I follow. So I was always kind of curious of the different guys that who film for them, and I, when I stumbled upon your channel, I heard the name a few times, but then when I finally got it, I'm like, okay, I have to talk to this guy. So now that we're getting into it, I, I want to I hear the, the whole story of um, basically how I started the podcast, though, is how you got into fishing and, like, who got you into it. That's pretty, basically the first step. And then afterwards, I want to know when you kind of started this huge passion for for media and editing that you're you're doing now. Yeah, no, absolutely, man. I've been fishing since I was two years old. I grew up in Florida, so it, it was it was one of those things where my my dad he grew up fishing uh, up in Connecticut, and uh, he brought down that passion for bass fishing uh, down south where we were living at the time. And I had a rod in my hand most of the time. I would go bouncing around ponds and like country club uh <laughs> little cul-de-sacs and whatnot where friends were living and i i always had this passion passion for fishing uh yeah but bass fishing was kind of primary numero uno uh the entry point for me and you know everything started to shift as i you know i, I you know going in fishing ponds is great and all but it just never really sparked it so i moved up to connecticut when i was 10 and while I was up there, my dad introduced me to fly fishing, which really is one of my biggest passions in life. I, I would much rather pick up a fly rod over a spin or bait casting uh -huh. rod any day of the week. And, uh, you know, we started fishing little streams uh, and it, it ended up becoming, OK, I've got a pond where I know there's a ton of bluegill. There's a ton of bass throwing poppers and having them crush top waters. And as that passion continued to grow uh, or grow, uh, my, my parents moved back down to Florida and that's when, you know, my eyes just opened wide up. I started to fall in love with flats fishing. I started to target redfish, snook, tarpon, oh, speckled trout. And now, you know, I, I have the ability and, uh, the, the network of great friends that I've made over my time where when I go down to Florida, it's, it's a phone call away to go ahead and see what my buddies that are guides down in the Everglades are doing. And I can, you know, hop on their boat and we can go get lost for 12 hours and go on, you know, trips to Pulaski, New York and fish for steelhead on fly, uh, coming down South fishing with him on a flats boat and going after tarpon and uh redfish and snook so just slowly but surely the passion grew but it all stems from hanging out on a back pond with a little stick bait a sanko or one of my favorites was a lake fork ring fry and oh. you know just fishing for bass man and it's it's grown into something i don't think i ever thought it would ever become so it's it's super super cool um it's my, one of my biggest passions in life and uh i i'm yeah, I, I don't know if I could live without it. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they say that when you become so obsessed or, like, addicted to something, they call it, like, a almost like a sickness. Where It's almost like in a good way, though, that what this drive we have for fishing is just so immense that they relate it to so many, you know, different avenues. Like, they take – that's why they call it a drug is, you know, that your addiction to fishing. It's 150%. It's, it's yeah, it's undescribable. But I, I'm curious because – you seem so passionate about fishing, but also it seems you have a immense passion for your media as well. When did that kind of start start in your your life in that timeline? Yeah, man, this is actually kind of funny. So after freshman year of college, I went on a fishing trip with a buddy. We went down to the Florida Keys. We took a ginu. I don't know if you know what a ginu is, but it's essentially yeah. it's a mixture. It's 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 a Frankenstein combination of a skiff, 
okay. and a canoe. So, you okay. know, it's about a, it's a 16 foot little skiff canoe that's maybe three and a half foot wide, maybe three foot wide. And it was my baby. I fished all over South Florida with it. And uh, I had the opportunity to go ahead for six days, send it down south to the Florida Keys. And me and my buddy, we were targeting tarpon. And uh, we didn't know what we were kind of getting ourselves into. We knew the uh, the program. We needed to get live mullet. We needed to, uh, you know, be on the bridges. We needed to sit, wait, or we needed to be on the flats and watch these guys start roaming through on their migratory path. So while I was down there, I brought a GoPro and I started just, you know, making little snippets of GoPro stuff. And, you know, it was nothing crazy. I'd played with GoPros before. Uh, I had made uh, little snowboarding edits when I lived in Connecticut. They were horrible. They were terrible. <laughs> there was nothing special about them. Uh, but at that point, I was starting to gain a following with photo. And I didn't have a camera at the time. I just used my phone. But I utilized social media and the hashtags to really branch out and touch a broader audience. With that being said, after I, I posted a couple of those things, I started to get some following from some fishing guides and some fishing guys down in the Keys. So I was like, all right, cool. Like, they're following me now. I, I need to post some fishing stuff. Like, that's – I really want to get into it. So slowly but surely, I started to post fishing uh, material and content, whether I was out on a flat and I was just taking a photo of me and my rod in the sunset or I, I caught a nice redfish and, you know, I was composing my shot and – uh, I didn't know or had I hadn't taken any photography classes at the time. So it was it was all brand new, but people seemed to love it. And people were hitting me back up saying, hey, man, you got something here. You got it. You got to do something with this man. Like, I love your photos, yada, yada, yada. Mm -hmm. You know, fl flash forward, uh, maybe about two years after that, I took my first photography class at college. And, uh, funny enough, like I dropped out of college, I'm a college dropout. I, I took that class and I did not learn a ton, but it only allowed me to continue to focus on something that I was having fun with. And at the time I was driving out into the middle of the night into the boondocks of Florida near Lake Okeechobee. And I was taking astrophotography and that was something that continued to spark this photo, I gotta have a camera in my hand. So I ended up buying my first camera and I'm out there at like 2 a.m. as the Milky Way is rising on the horizon and it's pitch dark and you can see it with your eyes and I'm by myself or with a buddy and I'm jumping up, up and down, freaking out. It's the coolest thing ever. I'm getting these photos and that right there was kind of like that pinnacle moment where I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna have a camera for the rest of my life. And uh, I, I haven't looked back since. With that being said, flash forward another year, I start really going hard on it. I start taking portraits of my friends and uh, I start taking more fish photos. And I finally got the ability to film for an EDM nightclub. It's like the most backwards thing possible. It's so far away and so uh, retracted away from fishing. But yeah. I got this chance to film for this nightclub. Uh, I, I was I had done some music production. I know my story is all over the place, but I had done some music production and a DJ at the nightclub was like, hey, man, I see your photos. I, you know, I like your music. Uh, yeah, we got an opening for a videographer position. Our buddy Terry Beeman is looking for somebody to take over. Uh, you know, would you be interested? And I was like, hell yeah, sure. So. I got in touch with this kid, end up going there, um, kind of just did a walkthrough one after, or not afternoon, I'm sorry, one late evening. These, sh these shows were going from 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. in the morning. So went there, did that, and always had a love for EDM. And and uh, <laughs> he was like, all right, cool. Like next weekend, you got two shows, make it happen. Did it, filmed it, and uh, learned Premiere Pro, the editing software that I use in a weekend. Uh, I learned it with a buddy. I sat down with the footage. We sat down and we went through all of the shortcuts and all the things that I needed to do. And over two years of me filming at that nightclub, I was able to hone my skills. I was able to learn my the software that I, I've come to know as my job now. Mm -hmm. And 
I was able to get a stylistic tone that not a lot of people have. Most people come from the fishing industry and they stay in the fishing industry or they come from the hunting industry and stay in the fishing industry. Nobody really comes from the EDM industry. And mm. it, it's a lot of fast paced, action packed movements. A lot, a lot is driven on the music, which is something that I pride myself in my work. And mm. once I had done it for two years and over the course of that time, I picked up small commercial gigs where I'm filming for like small businesses an AC company, some real estate stuff. I was like, I'm tired of this, man. 11, a 11 p.m. to 3 a.m., sometimes 4 a.m., getting home at 5 a.m. I was sick and tired. I was working 80 to 90 hours a week on with with this and my, my regular day-to-day -day job, my 9 to 5. And I was like, I'm done with this, man. So I built up a team. I handed it on over, and I started taking less and less of those gigs. You know, lo, lo and behold, I was like, I really need to get back into fishing. I haven't fished in like <laughs> months. I was, I was, I was having this, this withdrawal period and yeah, man, I made, I made this edit. I made this little edit of a Stero Bay down in Florida near Fort Myers and it opened up a ton of eyes. It absolutely, you know, exceeded my wildest expectations with the amount of people that were reaching out to me then saying, yo, this is incredible. This is great work. This is so cool. So yeah. I, I got an opportunity with one of the companies that I was doing a photo shoot with called Avid Gear. They had, they had loved my photography. Yeah. They used my, my work for iCast and a lot of their social and, uh, they, they let me do an edit and that edit was the pinnacle for me in terms of, okay, I've got something here. It's super unique. I started having guys like Tom Rowland of Saltwater Experience reach out to me saying, hey, man, I've seen your work. I'm loving it. it, was, it I, I, you know, I would love an opportunity to uh, try and get together with you sometime. I got reached out to by Captain Jack Productions, Jacko Lucas, who is an absolutely incredible videographer, but a legendary guide who, you know, on the DL, we're going to be doing me, myself, and my boss – uh, are going to be doing a trip with him in February through March in a place that I might touch on later, but I, I really can't say at the moment. But yeah, these big name guys started reaching out to me and I was like, all right, cool. This is sick. So this is where it gets really juicy. At the time, uh, <laughs> I was working for a social media marketing managing company, uh, an agency, and I was handling around nine different businesses in the outdoor space from tree stands to cookers to um to uh, fishing seats to uh crossbows i'm handling it all and while i'm sitting in in at my home i was working remote i'm like scrolling on my phone i'm, I'm like on a break but i'm i need to get back into the, my grind i need to start engaging with people i need to start making posts yada 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 i'm on my personal page and i saw that my current boss john b who's mm -hmm. a youtube creator was looking for a videographer. So I'm like, ah, I can, I can take five to 10 <laughs> minutes out of my time to go and reach out to him. I'd always looked at John B as an innovator in the YouTube space with the trips that he was making, the videographers that he was associating himself with and pushing content that not a lot of people in the fishing space do. Like going to Australia and spending seven days on the rocks with the morning tide guys or going to the Amazon and fishing for giant peacocks. He was the trendsetter in all of that in yep. my eyes and more importantly on the cinematic scale. So I was like, all right, cool. Let me give this guy a shoot or uh, a shout. And yeah, man, I sent the email, sent him about four of my EDM edits, four of my fishing edits which, by the way, I'd only been filming fishing for maybe four to five months. I had collected like six edits in the time. So I was pretty new to the fishing scene, but I was just making Instagram bangers. There were one minute like yeah. clips, nothing special. Yeah. And so I sent him that uh, over that kind of stuff and some commercial work. And 10 minutes later, he hit me up and was like, dude, you've got something here. I freaking love this. When can we get on a phone call? And I'm like, I'm working remote again. I mean, again, I'm working remote. And I was like, yeah, I could take another like 10, 15 minutes to hop on a call. So I yep. was like, Hey, here's my phone number. Uh, reach out to, excuse me, reach out to me now. Uh, I'm free. We got on the phone. 
20 minutes later, he had me a flight book to Texas in three days to go and quote unquote, try out for the job. So flew to Texas, filmed a video for him. He dug it. And, uh, two months later I was in a U-Haul with my car towing behind it, moving to Dallas, Fort Worth. And I'm now, now nine months into working for John B. That that is a a ride and a half if I've ever heard. Of. <laughs> Talk about the different avenues, different things, but I think while that's like it's crazy and it took you so long to obviously get to where you want in the fishing industry, I think all those kind of culminating together kind of it's perfect for your skill set to make his videos what they are now. Because even like some of the smaller videos he has, whether it's you editing them or not, it's. Literally, like, they're masterpieces where you look at some of these guys who have, like, a big following and, like, no disrespect to, to Mike from One Rod, but, like, there is little to no editing in his, in his videos. Yeah, but like, yeah. But that's, it's, but it's, that's the thing. That's his, yeah, that's his shtick, exactly, right? Like, exactly. He, but it's relatable. So it's, it's really interesting for me to come from a side where uh, you need to have a short retention span. It needs to be quick. It needs to be cinematic. And it needs to be uh, fast-paced. But then, you know, watch, you know, someone like Mike One Rod, One Reel and pump out these, these not so cinematic, just kind of relatable, easy to follow chess cam videos and then an iPhone vlogging situation. And he kills it. He absolutely yeah. kills it. But yeah. again, it's relatable. It's super relatable. Anybody can do that. So that's why I think there's so much of a draw. And, you know, with, with John and I, we try and blend the two together. We're trying to do these cinematic series. We're trying to do these epic fishing series and epic fishing videos and then blend it with these relatable, I'm pond hopping, I'm just looking on Google Maps, I'm using fish brain, and, you know, trying to keep it simple, so I keep going back to that with him, because he's like, oh, like, you need to be filming me for this, um, you know, you know, make sure to get all this B-roll, and I've, I've kind of come off of that a little bit, based off of the content that we're trying to portray it, uh, you know, if, if it's just pond hopping, like, let's, Let's keep it. Let's keep it personal. Let's keep it like that POV, one on one, camera in hand, uh, kind of talking points, and then straight back to GoPro and keeping it simple. But yeah, man, it's uh, I, I come from a very different place, and trying to get this this twenty minute, fifteen minute, twenty five minute long, you know, pieces from my one minute shorts was a challenge and a half. Oh, I I can imagine, but it, like I think it's cool though because you kind of you stumbled upon how like you said each person has a different style, and I think that a part of that you kind of you know as you go on these trips and these adventures with John, and you you kind of have this style in mind. That's part of your your like you said your social media marketing, um, yeah. you know your, your skill set from there is where, you know obviously everyone wants to see like the B roll and everything, but it, it's cool how you attribute it, you know. If you're going to do, like, I guess the, the sort of blue-collar way of pond hopping and whatnot, have that kind of style with the video, whereas you're going to go extravagant places like peacock, you know, peacock fishing, where you want to have those epic shots that are a little bit more attributed to that. And it's, that is so cool. It, it's, it puts a new perspective. Like, a lot of people say um, that I've, I've spoken to um, a few years saying how, you know, YouTubers, how it's um, nothing compared to, like, TV, how there's not that much going into it. Totally wrong. Totally wrong. And you, <laughs> with my videos, I spent I spent two hours creating videos for edits that are nowhere even near compared to the videos that you guys pump out. And it, like you just said uh, earlier offline that you spent what five hours today editing. The amount of work that comes in to make these masterpieces are, are unreal. And I think that's the style that you help John portray. It's what he's known for is these you know theatrical videos that he pumps out on you know at weekly. It's it's incredible the work that you guys do. Oh, you have no idea, man. So, uh, my my first experience with like a longer format video, the 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 literally the first one took me eight hours to do, and it was a twenty two minute long edit. Uh, that was just I, I I I it was me learning. But when I'm going ahead and I'm making these longer pieces, a great example would be. Australia. We did a 10 part series in Australia where we took a road trip from New South Wales in the mountains, waking up at, you know, uh, 6 a.m. and it's 17 degrees Fahrenheit. And then we traveled 3,500 kilometers up the coast to Cairns 
in uh, Queensland, the northern section of Queensland, where it was 82 degrees and we're in a rainforest. Those videos, I mean, cumulatively, they took me 200 hours to edit. 200 hours. I was there for like a week and a half to like two weeks grinding on these things. And, but again, I was, I was specifically, specifically formatting these these videos to be like a Netflix series where you can binge watch. There's a little bit of a trailer in the beginning. You, you've got this little sneak peek of the episode in the front end, and then it cuts on into the trailer. And then on the back end, there's a teaser for the next one. Um, every Everything is uh, very methodical when I go about making these, these series, these cinematic series. And they're, they're so much different than, you know, these short edits that I'm cranking out. Uh, for example, the, the five hours that I spent today, I yep. was finish, finishing up a, an ice fishing edit from this, uh, this trip that I just did with John where we were up in Maine. And, uh, you know, he just bought a cabin up there. He wants to do more, you know, backwoods kind of stuff. So, you know, those, those, those little videos I can crank out. They're pretty easy. There's not a, there's not too much of a storyline there. There's some main points that we got to make, but other than that, it's catching fish, man. And that's what people want to see when they're at home or they're getting home from work. They can't get out and they just want to sit at home on the couch and watch people crush fish. And, uh, yeah, man, it's there. It's such a discrepancy between when I'm going super hard on the cinematic uh, series and then when I'm just cranking out these these little edits, uh, these little videos for for John on on a weekly basis. Yeah, it's it's crazy, I, and I can relate to that part. Where I'm out here in New York, we're in that weird, funky stage where lakes are like an inch of ice or like, <laughs> like two days of 45 degrees in sun or rain. So then they become like 33 degrees and they're open. It, it's just a weird phase. So for me, it's nice because I can sit down and I can watch somebody else catch fish and that kind of pushes off my addiction to want to get out there. And then of course it pushes me to the point where I have to go fish and catch nothing. But it's, it's, it's awesome to like to watch these different channels. I couldn't tell you how many channels I'm subscribed to at this point. But the amount of detail that more and more people are putting into, and it's it's wild the different like skill set people like yourself that you guys use in these edits. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, you know, I put like two hours in this thing that I thought was good. And I look at this, I'm like, oh damn, I got a lot to learn. Like it's like it's 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 incredible. But it's also you know the your road to where you are now, the amount of work you put in those those two years working crazy amount of nights i don't even want to know the amount of hours you put into those nightclub but uh, yeah man to put it to put it simply i was working basically minimum wage uh making maybe like eight to ten bucks an hour doing those shows and again it was all passion driven like i loved i loved being in that venue i loved uh the artists that they were bringing on in to go ahead and you know just like any sort of youtuber or creator i think it's it's beautiful to to do an artist justice, especially on the nightclub scene, to do someone justice based off of their music and to showcase maybe uh, a, a, a show that they're bringing with all their production and uh, just try and just highlight a little bit of that creativity that went in on their on their end and just showcase it the best that you can. Uh, there's something beautiful between the, that, those two things. So I kind of take that same approach when we go to these amazing places. I love nature. I, I could spend all day outdoors. I, I, I don't, don't get me wrong. Like I really enjoy getting nitty gritty on the editing scene, but if I truly believe that my passion lies in going to places that are untouched, untamed and have fish that have never seen a lure before. And then to showcase and document that is like the most exhilarating and memorable thing that you could possibly do. Uh, you know, I, I'm just, I, I, again, I'm super blessed to have the position that I have. Um, I, I count those blessings every single day. I make sure John knows that on a regular basis because <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm super grateful, man. I, there's a, there's a lot of the story and my hardships that I went through that I, I, I won't touch here, but, but more importantly, uh, if, if you have a drive for something, if you have a passion for something and you find a way to make that a living, dude, you've, you've crushed it. You, you may, you've made it. And for right now, I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of riding the coattails of John 
and uh, not not really, uh, you know, being a, a singular entity, a freelancer, but I'm, I'm creating and he's allowing me to create in a way that I foresee. Uh, Australia was my vision all through and through. Devil's River, which is one of uh, my favorite series that I've ever made, and it was the first one I ever made. I mean, that out of four videos has like a cumulative total of like 3 million views. And the first episode is like 1.3 million views. Uh, th that was that was such one of the coolest trips ever, man. And uh, and then the editing process behind it was just it was grueling. Don't get me wrong, but it was so much fun. It was so much fun, man. So I'm, I'm super blessed to be in the position that I'm at. And uh, uh, you have no idea what's coming in 2020. There are some cool trips coming down the line. And I am in this killer mindset of I'm going to absolutely murder that 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 content and make something that's so unique, so special that I think it's just going to you know be a placeholder in, in YouTube in itself. People are going to look at it so completely differently. I'm so excited. You're making the, the ham back my neck stand up. Like, let's get hyped. You know what I'm saying? Like, oh man, I'm so freaking hyped. You have no idea, man. I'm so I hyped. <laughs> I can't wait for it. I'm curious. How many, how many different cameras are involved? Like, do you utilize in your, you know, in your, in your arsenal to, to make these? So, you know, on, on a daily basis, we're just kind of running, you know, two cameras. Uh, it, it, it's again, kiss. Keep it stupid simple. We run a camera A, which is going to be a Sony A7 III with a 16 to 35 millimeter f 2.8 G Master lens, and then we're running our uh, our. our our shotgun mic on top it's just a road pro nothing special um but yeah so that's camera a that's that's for vlogging that's for uh b-roll shots that's for wide angle shots that's for me pointing the camera at john or cam or john holding the camera and pointing it at himself and then we're running our camera b which is the gopro uh that chest cam is such a staple in YouTube videos nowadays. Um, but yeah, so we run a GoPro Hero 8 right now. We've gone through fours. We've gone through, or at least John's gone through, excuse me. He's gone through five, six, seven. You count it, it's there. Um, but we found that, I mean, for anybody that's looking to get into YouTube and fishing, um, what we found is the GoPro Hero 4, which isn't sold anymore. They're all refurbished. Uh, it tends to be the best audio quality and picture quality that you can get uh, out of the, the chest cam scene. Um, but the GoPro Hero 8 so far has done pretty well. We run some dead cats, which essentially just, you know, masks out the wind a little bit over the microphone ports on the Hero 8. And that seems to be doing well. Uh, we, we haven't really had any problems with it but those are our two main cameras when we're running and gunning every day um you know pond hopping videos but when we go on these longer trips that's when things get super interesting that's when i am bringing minimum three lenses the 16 to 35 a 24 to 70 g master 2.8 and a 70 to 200 g master 2.8 and then we're also bringing a spare body of the a7 III and we're bringing probably one or two other gopros one directly focused at uh underwater shots another one just as a backup and then we're also bringing a drone uh i'm right now uh, we use my drone which is a mavic 2 pro uh it's got the one inch hasselblad uh camera on it so we're bringing tons of equipment into these places and you know, you, you try and pack light, but at the end of the day, you never know what you're going to run into. So yeah. I'm normally carrying 40 pounds of gear on my back, walking on into treacherous territory, whether we're climbing up mountainsides, um, trying to get to these hidden creeks, or we're on a river, like the Devil's River, and I've got two pelican cases in the back of the kayak with... 15 to 20 grand worth of camera gear and all it takes is for us to flip that kayak and lo and behold if if it's not sealed properly there goes thousands of dollars of camera equipment so that's kind of the the expedition and then everyday setup and i do want to make something super clear for anybody out there that's trying to film you don't need all this stuff we have it because we 
want to have it, but you don't need it. A small DSLR or a mirrorless body from Sony, Canon, Nikon, what have you. Panasonic's another great one, but if you can have a small body that films in 1080p, 60 frames per second, and you buy a 16 millimeter pancake lens, a lens that does not change focal length, you can film yourself and then all you need is a GoPro. It you don't need all the bells and whistles. You 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 just need to keep it simple. And there's so many tutorials online that can help you in that search. You don't have to overthink it. And I get questions like this a lot on Instagram. What should I get? What's what's the best camera that I should do? And my biggest recommendation to anybody out there is go light on the camera body. Most camera bodies are filming in that 1080p, 60 frames per second nowadays, and go heavy on glass. Glass changes the way that you see um, your image. And when I say glass, I mean lenses. And yep. uh, you want your wide angle for your face shots when you're you know, self-vlogging or you're, you're, it's sitting on a tripod and you want as much room to, to see what's happening. And then you want a nice B-roll lens or a cinematic lens. My favorite lens of all time is a 50 millimeter f1.8. I love that lens. The bokeh on it is stupid. The creamy background that makes it have that professional look. And it's sharp as a tack. And that was one of the first lenses I bought. And it was 150 bucks. Like, you don't need to go ahead and spend $21 to $2,500 on a lens to get cinematic quality. And I think that's what people get all jacked up about is, oh, my God, I got to spend all this money to get up to that quality. No, you don't. It's not, it's not rocket science, guys. There's so many tutorials. If you want to learn about cameras, seriously, a great guy to uh, look into is Peter McKinnon. Peter McKinnon, um, Potato Jet is another great one. It, there's, there's so many great YouTubers out there that are taking the time, as you know, as you absolutely know, to edit these videos and to share information that is vital to, I mean, anybody that's willing to learn. So... <laughs> That's that's my two cents. I'm done with my rant. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it was perfect. That's I think a lot of people need to hear that. And and it really, if you're just looking to to make a fishing YouTube series, I mean, all you really need is a GoPro. I mean, you don't even yeah. need like a DSLR. Like uh, one of my buddies that I grew up fishing with, um, Greg Blanchard, who's now a pro, uh, he's a pro kayak angler from California. He does everything, you know, like the the self filming, the vlogging, the what have you, from his GoPro. It, like everything absolutely you wouldn't even know the difference well, i mean obviously you would looking at a video of john b's towards his that's but that's still, just it's, me <laughs> yeah that's exact, just yeah. me I, if, I think yeah people get in their heads about that kind of stuff mm -hmm. they yeah. just get up in their own head and they're like i gotta have the best i mean but the isn't isn't that like society right now i mean everyone wants the latest iphone everyone wants the latest tesla everyone wants the the best of the best but in all actuality you can do everything you want with your phone. If you're lucky enough to have an iPhone 8 or a 7, you, yeah. could, you could vlog yourself. If you got a GoPro, you don't need a GoPro Hero 8. You could have a GoPro 4, which refurbished, I think, costs like 200 bucks. You're fine. You're good. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think some of the, the Hero sessions are even are even going for... 150 or less like it's exactly that's, that's what i run for all mine and i have you know an external battery because you can't you know it's not the uh the inserts like the the hero like the Perfect. hero eight and whatnot but so it's running all day and you have you know 64 to 256 uh, gig sd cards and you just have run forever so no that's that's exactly it man right yeah. um a, a, a good friend of mine and john's who you may have heard of. He goes by Cezarn.Fishing. His name yep. is Cade. Yep. Uh, he runs a hero session as well. And uh, another big point that you made was everyone always asks, what mic are you running on the GoPro? I see that cord sticking out of it. No, we're normally running an external battery. It's probably like a 10,000 milliamp anchor battery. It slides into your pocket. You just run a USB-C type cable into your GoPro or your micro USB, and that thing's going to last you all day. You don't need to have a baggie of little batteries, and you don't need to keep continue to, to take it out, plug it in, take it out, plug it in i alex perrick is one of those guys that still does that and i every single time i'm with him and he's filming i'm always giving him 
crap about it because <laughs> he, I'm like, get with the program. It's the 21st century. We're in 2020 now. You should be running an external battery to your uh, GoPro. Yeah. You never have to worry about charging it ever again. Oh. No, it's cr crazy. It's super easy because with that chest mount, you just run that cord under your chest mount and around it, and it, it doesn't even ever really get in the way. It's never. it's crazy. But I'm kind of moving past that. I'm, I'm curious because – you try, obviously with working with John B, you see some amazing places. You obviously travel a lot. I'd imagine, you know, if you could give one to each of a positive, negative, of you know this amount of travel and amount of editing and whatnot. Do you think you could put a number on each one of them? So what you're asking is, uh, you know, what would I score the traveling aspect, and then what would I score the editing aspect of it? Like kind of. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to get a better grasp of what you're I asking. Guess I'll, I'll rephrase it. With your position with John, is there a, could you give a positive and then a, a negative? Oh with yeah, you know, yeah, absolutely. Um, big positive is I get to go to amazing places and I get to document this, uh, this goofball who runs around with his wiener dog and likes to fish. It's a pretty darn good fisherman, but is sometimes a little bit on the, yeah, again, goofy side. He he's just uh, he's he he's like a hamster on a wheel. I think that's a good way to put it. <laughs> he's always running. He's always thinking, and sometimes he skips, uh, you know, li little things. And and that's that's all of us. When when you're running and gunning, you're you're overthinking a lot of things. So that's what I'm here to do. On top of that, I'm also supposed to be a little bit of a level he level head. So yeah, I get to go to these amazing places with John, um, regardless of how much of a goofball he is. Um, but I would say the negative is. Just the preparation, oh, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. The preparation that goes into getting to these places and then filming in these disclosed locations uh, is an immense challenge. You guys have no idea how much physical uh, uh, exhaustion you know, someone like myself goes through. Uh, Australia was a perfect example. Hiking eight miles deep into this this gorge um, in snake ridden territory on a rainy, mucky day, carrying 40 pounds on my back, being left behind um, from John and the guide and his buddy Scott and me not knowing where the hell I am. I'm like over here going, what the hell's going on? I'm, I'm lost. I'm, 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 I'm exhausted. I don't know what I can or can't do at this moment in time. I'm like, this kind of sucks, man. <laughs> but, 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 at the, but at the end of the day, the pro and con of it, they all get washed out because I have this passion that drives me so deeply. And I, 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 at the, at the end of the day, regardless of, you know, how sore and exhausted I am hiking onto these places and, you know, I, I may be unprepared for the terrain that we're dealing with, because a lot of the time we're, we're learning this stuff on the fly. It's, yeah. you got to pack for everything and then you better hope that you brought everything. So yeah, man, I, I, I truly love what I do, um, regardless of, you know, dealing with a goofball at times and then also hiking into some places that are super sketchy uh, for anybody, not even somebody that's carrying 40 pounds of camera gear on their back. <laughs> I can't even imagine. But yeah, it's probably a work guy. He's pretty fit running around getting the different shots and whatnot. I can't even imagine trying my to keep cardio for sure. Alone. Oh, yeah. I mean, let alone keep your all that camera gear from getting wet and broken uh, and that's true sure, that's a <laughs> job in itself yeah uh yeah that's uh that's something that is you you just you can't do it the <laughs> mother nature will take everything from you in this in a second so <laughs> i i try my best to keep everything clean uh but 2019 we went through two camera bodies and uh, i think we've already gone through another one in 2020 being up in maine it sounds like john might have broken the audio uh, or microphone port on the a7 III that we have so we might have to go back to the stone age and go to the a7s2 Ooh, big 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 <laughs> downfall right there <laughs> That's funny. so i'm guess i kind of kind of piggybacking off here talking about australia so much in your perspective was that probably the coolest place you you ventured with uh, being with john oh hands down uh australia was a 14 day trip and being on the road with those guys, experiencing a culture, a community, and 
a country by road was probably the coolest thing that I've gotten a chance to experience. And I've been to a lot of different places. I spent a lot of time in South Africa when I was in my middle teenage years. I was doing some missionary work over there uh, but before I became 18 and kind of realized that maybe maybe I was preaching the wrong thing. Um, but I'll leave, <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've been to Belize. Uh, I've been to Alaska. I've been all over uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. I, I've I've gone to some really cool places, but Australia and seeing that and you know being this legendary country that I think anybody would be wrong to say, oh no, I don't want to go visit Australia. Uh, it, it was it was just such an incredible experience. But I think that's going to get topped here in 2020 as we go on into some new places that I I mean, man. Uh, that, yeah, yeah. We'll we'll get we'll you know. we'll get to that at the end of uh, of this because I think we just booked our tickets. Uh, maybe maybe around a week ago we booked our tickets to this very very interesting place, and I'm very excited about that trip. Awesome. Oh uh, yes. I mean, anyone listening is probably excited to see see what it's going to be. But it, it, it's it's awesome. It's Australia. It's it's unfor- I want to kind of bring it up slightly. Just it's unfortunate, you know, what's going on obviously now and and whatnot with the, the fires and everything over there. Hopefully that gets resolved soon for such a beautiful yeah. place. I'd like to see it in its natural state, not not a half-burned state. That would be unfortunate. But, you know, Mother Nature is Mother Nature, so we'll see. Well, we'll see things I, don't, I don't know if you knew this, but a lot of Australian officials in the fire department are actually claiming that there were about 200 arson attacks. So they're, they're finding oh. that these fires might have started by arsony, which is someone lighting a fire and burning bush. And due to the climate and the current situation of the weather patterns that are going on there, I'm, I'm a big meteorologist and climatologist fan. I actually went to school for my freshman year for meteorology. So I stay up to date with weather as much as possible. And you know, thankfully, I've got people in high places when it comes down to uh, weather. I uh, have access to all of the model guidance that uh, they would have access to And yeah, no, uh, everyone's, you know, and rightfully so, like the climate is is in a very bad state and we are seeing some tremendous warming periods and sea level rising. But they truly believe right now, Australian officials, that these were arson attacks and they can account for 200 of them of where the, the burning started. So, you know, while yes, the climate plays a, 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 a part in this, but it's more so weather. Climate is a period of 30 years that you have to look at. So yes, there's been warming in the climate, but the weather pattern that they just saw, which was high temps and a lot of wind, which is prime for wildfires. Yeah. Uh, it was just a culmination of all these different variables that came into play. And now it's like 15.5 million acres or heca acres that have been burned. It's incredible. And it's terrible to see because we've got friends over there and a lot of the like you said a lot of these beautiful places um you know they're they're burning and you know this this wildlife is is running for its life and it's i mean i got goosebumps thinking about it and talking about it right now it's it's heartbreaking it's absolutely heartbreaking yeah i hope something is resolved you know you know that they can get a grasp on it here soon it's 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 very unfortunate. It's tough to see all the the pictures shared from wildlife and and whatnot. Um, they actually have, uh, I believe, over the next week. I think that they're going to have two tropical cyclones coming on in from the north western territories that will make their way south and then to the east, um, and may might dim some of these fires because as they get these tropical cyclones, they get tons and tons of rain, and hopefully that diminishes some of the. Yeah uh the effects of these fires but um yeah man it's 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 incredible to watch these stories from friends that we've made over in australia you know pleading to us and sending us pictures it's it's heartbreaking that's that's great do you guys plan on you know trying to you know start anything or any kind of sort of trend thing not, towards not, not, oh. not that i know of at the moment um that would be a decision that john would make based off his um his intentions um at the end of it all like the guy truly is one of the most humble human beings i've ever met he stems from a very small family with not a lot of wealth started with a 
a Kodak camera of all things. He he came from nothing. He came from nothing in terms of the video side of things. It wasn't like he was handed a a big DSLR. So um, you know, he he he's, he has very uh strong foundational roots and is very humble. And I I you know I'm not sure if if John's going to do it, but uh, I mean I would love to see him go ahead and do something in regards for the the wildfires that are going on in Australia. However, I don't know if he he wants to go ahead and say, "Hey, uh, subscribers, you know, you know, these this eighteen to thirty four demographic, go ahead and you know, uh, donate five dollars to you know whatever uh, agency is there. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I they already do so much um, in terms of supporting his channel. I, I just don't know. I don't know. I'm I'm kind of yeah. you know I'm I'm I I, I yeah. can have my own opinion, but yeah, that's that's up to him. Yeah, it, it's. It's tough because there's only so much you can do to help on that level, and there's so much you can ask other people, and in your own efforts, it's tough. Um, I was only curious asking because I know with his, at least from the persona he gives off of YouTube, and as you said, he's a very humble guy. It's, it seems like something that you, you know, he would at least uh, mention. Like I, I just see it's very streamlined with his nature. It's for I feel sure. Like that's something he definitely cares about. So I thought I thought I'd ask. Just curious. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so kind of getting away from all that and kind of moving towards uh, about to wrap up here. Um, is there any kind of any social media platforms, different things you want to shout out before we get into our last couple fun questions? Yeah, man, absolutely. So you can find me and my work at X Blackwell B L A C K W E L L on Instagram. That's where I post all my stuff. Uh, I do have a Vimeo, which I believe is the same. Uh, X Blackwell, B L A C K W E L L, and that's where I'm going to be posting a lot of my personal work in terms of longer format videos. But other than that, man, I'm I'm just an IG kind of guy. <laughs> awesome, yeah. And we'll we'll plug down your, your uh, Instagram link down in the description when we post to YouTube, and then Anchor. I'm sure you know what Anchor is for for podcasts. Yeah. We're posted every known. <laughs> pretty much every known podcast application. So that'll be down there for anybody listening or watching. They can click on there, drop you a follow, show you some love. Uh, if you want some, some high tech, you know, amazing photos and, and films, you got to You have to go follow. Uh, when I scrolled that, the one thing you brought up earlier is you with it, you driving two and a half hours to get the, the Milky way. That photo was unreal, dude. That was like the, <laughs> the shadow, the silhouette. That was, that was sick. Uh, there's so start... much there's so much preparation that goes into those kind of shots and oh, uh I can imagine. yeah, yeah. that's, it's, uh, it's that's cool. not a drive there place the camera take the picture go home i, I no 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 <laughs> yeah so so kind of transitioning to the how i kind of like to recap my podcast there's two fun questions i ask um cause i like to ask them because they're they're interesting they're kind of thought-provoking and everyone's answer is going to be different um yeah. So the first one is if you could invite any three people to dinner to sit down and, p- and pick their brain, any any people, uh, past or present, who would they be? So one person that I've always really wanted to pick their brain, specifically on the fly, uh, fly fishing scene, is Flip Pallet. Flip Pallet is a incredible uh, pioneer on the fly fishing scene. He really kind of kicked off saltwater fly fishing. So Flip Pallet would be one. Um, I would say I really want to kind of pick apart Neil deGrasse Tyson's thoughts. Uh, he's, he's an astrophysicist and one thing that I absolutely love. And as you mentioned, the Milky Way and, uh, astrophotography is astrology, but more so the study of the stars and outer, outer worlds and planets. I think it would be so freaking cool to just kind of talk with him about the physics and, um, you know, uh, moreover on that. And then I would say lastly, hmm, uh, somebody that I would want to sit down with and have a, probably a good deep conversation with. Maybe, maybe Warren. I uh, know, you know. I'm sorry. I'm gonna cut that. I would, I would love to pick apart Gary Vaynerchuk's mind uh, okay. on the current state of where content can be viewed and then where it would be next, especially on the fishing side of things, because that's where my head's at right now. It's what kind of content can we produce in 2020 and beyond that's going to touch more people, uh, build a b- bigger audience, but more, more so. Um, where the future might be for the fishing category, because I believe TV's dying, man. Like, yeah, yeah. On, de- on demand is more available than anything else right now, but YouTube 
having it be there right at your fingertips, you not paying for a subscription yeah. other than the fact that you're paying for internet. I would love to pick his mind on where we might be able to take fishing and where I might be able to take fishing uh, in, in the future. So those those would be my, my three. Flip Pallet, Neil deGrasse Tyson, and then Gary Vaynerchuk. I like that. And I guess I have two things but, uh, to comment off that is you are entirely correct. Like TV is dying. It's literally becoming everything streaming. Like smart yeah. TVs, like I can tell you we have two smart TVs in the house I'm in right now. And we use YouTube, Hulu, Netflix. And I think that's pretty much about it. Every like if we're watching TV, we're streaming, you know, NFL Sunday, Sunday ticket, and that's like that is that's it. We don't we don't watch regular TV. It's it's wow. like you said, it's a dying breed. Uh, my second thing, uh, you see a guy obviously from talking to you for the past hour is that you like all these little, like the the sciences and these different things that are very thought provoking and that most people have no don't do not understand. I'm I'm mm. curious. Do you listen to the the Joe Rogan podcast? Funny enough, on um, when when we were moving John into his main cabin, uh, we we drove from Chicago to Bangor, and the last 300 miles was in a pretty harsh ice and snowstorm. We spent a lot of time listening to Joe Rogan. And one of the people that we listened to on that Joe Rogan podcast was Forrest Galante or G A L A N T E. He is a, um, I believe a biologist and he actually searches for a lot of, uh, quote unquote extinct animals and he wants yep. to prove that they're they're real because there's a lot of places on earth that are still like unseen and he brought up the fact that there are these giant sloths in the amazon in like the andes and there's this little bowl where they might be but no one's ever been there uh, or at least hasn't been there in probably a millennia or thousands upon thousands of years yep. yeah no i like the joe rogan podcast they're, they're really good i don't know if you saw the or heard the Elon Musk podcast, but uh, yep. that was one that I listened to on that road trip. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, it was intriguing. He was a little bit slow to answer his questions, which kind of turned me off a little bit, but you can understand that he is really going into deep thought on how to answer, uh, yeah. you know, the, these, these thought provoking questions. Cause Joe Rogan was throwing out some heaters at him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it makes you think that either he's one kind of trying to think how she, he should answer it, or kind of two is like taking the time to, you know, get an actual a quality answer to him. But it's 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 if I figured you, you'd be one to, to listen to that because a lot of people that are interested in these different things and take uh, take, um, you know, I guess a motivation to learn about different stuff, whether it's, you know, neurology stuff with the brain or human history or in your case, you know, you know, with space and, and different things of untouched lands, what, whatever it may be. I figured you're pretty much what I'm trying to say is I'm pre I figured you're one to listen to Joe Rogan. I listened to that forest one as well. And Ooh, it, there's a good. bunch of interesting people on there. It's, it's, it's pretty fun, especially because it kind of opens your eyes to different things of possibilities and, and whatnot. But it's, yeah, I, I just want, I was curious because you sound like a guy, you kind of like when you listen to Joe Rogan for a while, you can kind of pick out the crowd who does listen to him and who doesn't because he has such a, a big following that people know about and listen to where it's like, okay, yep. You've definitely watched a Joe Rogan podcast before. It's, it's kind of funny. It's yeah, man. It, for, some, <laughs> for someone like me, uh, I, I don't get a chance to listen to a lot of podcasts mainly because I'm working, uh, honestly seven days a week. I'm on call whenever, wherever it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, do, it doesn't matter. Uh, so I don't get a lot of opportunities to listen to podcasts, but if I was driving in a car for X amount of time, uh, over like three hours, I'm, I'm probably going to turn on one of those podcasts and try to find someone that I would find super interesting. And, uh, yeah, man, I think it's something to be said about somebody that is willing to understand more than just, you know, the, the ground that we stand on. That's why I studied meteorology and yeah. I, I love the science behind it. It's why I love, I love, uh, 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 would it be cos cos cosmology cosmology like the study of the stars? I said astrology before, but that's not the actual uh, uh, the actual science. But yeah, man, uh, you got to look past just the the ground you walk on. You got to look at you know the layers above you and beyond to truly understand and have a grasp of you know this this little rock that's floating through space that we get a chance to live on, experience yeah. cool things, and go to places that. 
maybe mankind hasn't stepped foot on in thousands upon thousands of years. Yeah, it's it's a super, super interesting topic to debate and explore. And I think, if honestly, if there's anybody to, to find these places to to film and document, I mean, it's the dynamic duo right over here. You and you and John about to go find these mega sloths somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he can go ahead and find his long lost brother. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Yeah. But yeah, yeah man, dude, it's uh, where, where we're going um for 2020 is pushing the boundaries we've got one place in particular uh where we'll be somewhere in africa and that's pretty much where i'll leave it off but we're going to a place that for seven days i believe will be on unmarked ground uh it's an exploratory trip for those seven days there's another seven days that we're going to be also fishing in some of their prime locations but seven days where it's unexplored and they've been they've been doing a lot of research on the area and we're going to be pretty much like walking on the moon and throwing lures at fish that probably have never seen a lure before so finding those places i think truly drives john and, you know, it will be interesting to see how far he'll go with this whole YouTube journey. But for me, I, I think my passion lies in that and whether or not I'm with him in the next five years or 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 even even in a shorter period of time. I love working with him. Um, you know, you just never know where, where life goes. But, you know, for me, that's where my passion lies. That's where I want to go and and see some of these places uh, that no one else gets a chance to see it's like the last frontier and they're very small pockets in this world that i i, I truly want to document and pretty much just make a badass little 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 short oh, yeah. film on it man oh yeah yeah it's gonna be exciting i'm i'm super super excited to see what's to come with you guys now that it's we'll, we'll leave it at that for those listening just just look out just look out yeah, yeah. So, so to wrap things up on the podcast today, uh, this is the one I just like to highlight is, you know, first thing that comes to mind, favorite fishing memory. Favorite fishing memory is probably my first bonefish on fly. I was on the border of Belize and Mexico after my senior year of high school. I My dad's been in the outdoor industry for about 35 years. Uh, yeah, I think, I think I've said, you know, I, I, I made a point there, but he had some connections. We were able to go on this trip down to El Pescador in Belize. And our guide took us to the border of Belize and Mexico. I uh, caught my first bonefish out of like this little pod that was in probably around five, five feet of water. And after I hooked that one and caught it, you know, had that ecstatic moment, I hopped out. I'm like in chest deep water and I start whacking these little one to two pound bonefish out of this school on a little six weight. And, uh, yeah, man, I probably caught like 10 or 12 bonefish in that little period. It was one of the cooler moments and I could share that with my dad. So yeah, definitely my favorite fishing memory. That, that is awesome, dude. Especially on the fly. I've heard that's like, that's like a staple in fishing. Like if you're going to want to go through a bucket list that a bonefish on the fly is one of them. Like, definitely that not that, perfect? definitely not that way where you're casting into a school of them like that, but to sight cast them in ankle deep water and watch them tailing in a little pack coming towards you and make that sight cast and watch them charge at it. I don't think there's anything better. Um, or there's not going to be many things in life that are going to drive that adrenaline, uh, through your, bl uh, bloodstream as much as a bonefish charging your fly and then peeling off all your, all your line into your backing on like maybe 10 to 15 pounds of drag. Jeez. That's awesome. It, this is, it's been an awesome time really like learning these different stories and hearing the different adventures you go on. I definitely would like to have you back on down the road to hear, especially recapping 2020 to see where you and John go. That would be awesome to, you know, to listen and to see the, you know, behind the scenes stuff that, that you guys do. Cause it's super interesting and it's, it's amazing. Cause you know, all of us, you know, million plus that have been watching his videos. Mm. Um, you, obviously you see what you present the, you, the amazing masterpieces you've presented for the past nine months. Uh, and it's it's I'm super excited to see what you guys are going to come up with, um, obviously, moving forward 2020. So I appreciate you taking time out of your very hectic schedule. Yeah, uh, thanks, Ben. To, to, you know, to speak with me and share the world, your story and what you do. And I'm sure everyone's looking forward to it. And for those listening or watching, I don't, I'm sure you're probably already subscribed to John B. Uh, go subscribe if you're not, because this guy is the one that's making all the, the magic happen. And go follow him on Instagram. So I'm sure love. So. Again, appreciate you coming on, Alex. 
Yeah, man. I appreciate you uh, having me. This was super fun. And I'm definitely down for maybe like a 2020 recap. Let's do it. Let's do it. I appreciate <laughs> it man. All right. You have a good one. Hey, you too.